In a world where pure imagination creates real friends with real feelings, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends steps in to act as a forever home to those friends whose children have outgrown. Because a good idea can never be forgotten. But while the home is chock full of some of the most colorfully creative and weirdly wonderful characters you could ever wish to meet, the imaginary friend in focus today is none other than Blue Regard Q Kazoo, or Blue to his friends. As we all know, the show revolves around the adventures of Blue and his best friend Mac. But Blue's real story, despite his bravado and outgoing personality, is, well, tragic. Having to give up living with his best friend, having to adjust to his new home, even having to deal with potentially being replaced, there's so much under the hood when it comes to Blue, and you always want to know more. So let's go through his past and into his present to find out everything about our favorite imaginary friend. Imagination became reality for Blue shortly following Mac's third birthday, after his mom had to give away his favorite comfort blanket. And from that day onwards, the two became the best of friends. They had daily adventures in Mac's home, getting up to all sorts of trouble. This goes on for five years and brings us up to the events of the show. Mac, now eight, still has his imaginary friend by his side. And in this world, well, that's a bit old to still be having an imaginary friend. So much so that Terrence, Mac's older brother, makes it his mission to bully and make fun of Mac for still having Blue around which, as you could imagine, causes the three to break out into fights almost daily. These fights push Mac's mom to the edge. That's enough. But Terrence is not the only one at fault here. I'm fed up with the three of you always fighting. We need to talk. So she pulls Mac aside and tells him that although Terrence is a huge jerk, he does have a point and that Blue shouldn't still be a member of their family, that Mac has outgrown him, and that worst of all, he needs to get rid of him. Obviously, Mac defends his friend, but all the while, Blue has been eavesdropping on the whole conversation, hearing how he has to be ripped away from someone he's known all his life just for having fun. I think this is where the problems really set in for Blue. He has to appear strong for Mac because he's hurting too, but Mac isn't the one who's being thrown away. Distraught, Blue tries to figure out a way where he can keep Mac's mom happy, but still get to see his friend pretty much whenever he wants. So that night, like a flash from the heavens, an advert for Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends appears on his TV and describes the home as a wonderful, wonderful imagination habitation. A place where discarded friends go to find their forever home. And better yet, they're allowed visitors. The next day, Mac and Blue head down to the home and register Blue as a new resident, and there he stays. But there's one small detail that's been left out. All of the other friends are up for adoption, and the only way Blue can be kept away from being adopted by someone else is if Mac promises to visit him every day at 3 p.m. Now that is a huge time commitment. Blue spends his first night in the home plagued by anxiety, hoping his best friend actually will come back for him the next day. Luckily though, a bunch of real nice imaginary friends, Wilt, Coco, and Eduardo, are by Blue's side to make sure he fits in. The next morning, after a restless night, Blue comes face to face with his first problem, a spoiled kid who only has eyes for Blue. She doesn't care how how. She wants him now, and demands that her rich parents adopt him for her. The other imaginary friends try their best to get Blue far away from the spoiled little girl, but all their plans fail, and the girl gets within touching distance of Blue. But who's there right in the nick of time? Mac. He foils the evil girl's plans, and whisks Blue away to go play. Meanwhile, Frankie tries to use this spoiled girl to her advantage to get an equally spoiled imaginary friend out of the home. Duchess. I mean, Duchess would jump at the chance to leave a home she clearly thinks is beneath her, but Duchess's taste is too rich, even for the spoiled little girl. Furious that anyone could want Blue over her, Duchess sets out for revenge. This is unacceptable! And by chance, recruits Mac's evil older brother to get rid of their little Blue problem by planning on feeding him to a monster. I want that cute, happy, fun-loving twerp wiped out and forgotten forever! So just to put that into context, not only has Blue been ripped away from a family home, away from his best friend, might I add, but now, just when he's trying to readjust his life, make new friends, and deal with everything that comes with it, the same person wanted him gone in the first place wants to get rid of him for good. Man, what a 24 hours. As you know, the episode wraps up with Mac and the others saving Blue, and everything settles down eventually. But the events of the first couple of episodes of the show stick with him forever. They shape who he is going forward, and influence how he acts from then on, which is obvious in the next episode, Busted. The episode starts with Blue being bossed around by Mr. Harriman, who's trying to make sure that the rules are abided by. Blue takes Mr. Harriman's orders personally, and believes he's being targeted and wants to be left alone. Harriman then informs Blue that he has already broken a house rule by not being able to be adopted. You've broken one rule to begin with, so I'm watching you. 
And if you do not toe the line, I have ways to persuade the madam to change her mind. So if Blue breaks any more rules, he won't be able to live there anymore. This terrifies Blue, who's just had one of the most turbulent weeks of his entire life. So he vows to stand still so he won't get into any trouble. However, when Mac, Wilt, Coco, and Eduardo ask him what he's doing, Blue starts moving all over the place while ranting. And he doesn't see Madame Foster's sculpture, and he accidentally knocks it over, shattering it into a million pieces. After breaking another rule and fearing the worst, Blue prepares to leave the house, which obviously makes sense given what's happened to him recently. But as a last resort, they ask the real Madame Foster to mime her sculpture. This works perfectly until they realize that, well, Madame Foster can't stay dressed as her sculpture forever. So they chase their tails, making mess after mess with Blue in total fear that his days at Foster's are coming to an end. That is, until they all come clean to Frankie, who after hearing their story, luckily sides with them and tells off Mr. Harriman for his crazy rules. I'm gonna let him know straight up that you busted the bust, and you shouldn't get busted for it. I mean, accidents happen, right? This just goes to show how conditioned Blue is to the fear of being abandoned. He's always prepared for the worst case scenario and goes into sheer desperation mode when it comes to making sure he stays at Foster's. Now, we've seen what happens when Blue is left all alone, but what about when he gets his own army? Like in this episode, Blue's Brothers, where Mac takes Blue to school for show and tell so his class can see just how cool his imaginary friend is. And just like usual, Blue tries his best to mop up the attention and is completely in his element, loving having so many eyes on him. But for once, everyone actually does think he's cool. The classmates are awestruck with Blue, so Mac tries to tell him that if they want an imaginary friend for themselves, there's loads to choose from back at Foster's. The two head back to the home to give the good news to Frankie about spreading awareness to the kids, where she gifts Mac and Blue two tickets to see the ice charades as an award. The attention has clearly inflated Blue's damaged ego, though, as he rubs his reward in the faces of his friends who really wanted to go to the show. Poor Eduardo. Blue's gloating continues for an entire day, but is soon interrupted by a doorbell, which reveals a kid from Mac's class who's looking to abandon his imaginary friend that looks very similar to Blue. The kid tells Blue that he imagined him soon after the show and tell, but the novelty of him wore off. He doesn't want him anymore. A little blip, maybe? A poor, unfortunate friend who will join the Foster's family and be adopted sooner rather than later? Well, no. The doorbell doesn't stop at Foster's for the next few hours. Kid after kid brings a different off-brand Blue to the door, wanting to give him up. It's bad enough that Blue had to be given up, but now he has to watch on repeats slightly different versions of himself being given up by kids, each one being told that they've got something wrong with them. I know Blue has a tough exterior, but seriously, that is rough. I mean, imagine seeing people say they don't want to deal with you over and over and over again for an entire day. That would shatter my feelings. I guess you could say Blue kind of deserved it for the ice charades gloating. Sadness isn't really Blue's first thought when his newfound brethren, however, as he forms them into an army and, you know, Blue, the power quickly goes to his head. What will he do now? Take over the home? the city, the world. We must sing the theme from the ice charades in 100 part harmony. Oh, ice charades, you're so icy and fun. The home becomes overrun with blues, causing trouble. Even when Mac arrives, he can't figure out which blue is his original pal, which is a problem considering they've got to head out to the show. But luckily, the theme that year is fruit, and the show doesn't have a blueberry. So the Blue Brothers combine to skate their way into glory for all to see during the ice charades, while real blue sits on the sidelines watching versions of him get all the attention. Now that's a real punishment. That episode may show us how blue would handle a different version of him getting the attention. But what if he was to be replaced by another imaginary friend created by Mac. This brings us to the episode Mac Daddy, where one morning Mac wakes up to find a new imaginary friend in his bed and takes him to Foster's. The new friend immediately gravitates towards Blue and asks him for some chocolate milk. Can I have some chocolate milk? Why do I look like your mother? Blue finally gives in to his weird new housemate and takes him to the kitchen where this happens. Mac shows up and tells Blue that the new friend is lactose intolerant, that he needs apple juice. He confuses chocolate milk with apple juice. Baffled, Blue asks Mac how he knows anything about this new friend and watches Mac clean and care for him. Mac tells Blue that this new friend is actually his baby brother. Jealousy skyrockets in Blue as he demands more clarity from Mac, who then says the last words Blue wanted to hear. He's Mac's new imaginary friend. But, but I don't understand. You've got me. Well, why 
why did you imagine someone else? Mac tells Blue that he didn't mean to imagine anyone else, that it just sort of happened. But those words offer no comfort to Blue, who's deeply hurt that his best friend could ever try to replace him. After all, that's all Blue is really. He was born to be Mac's best friend. Without that, what is he? Blue's sadness quickly turns to anger. He doesn't want to listen to any of Mac's excuses. Madam Foster then joins the three in the kitchen, where she tries to get to know her new foster friend by asking for his name, which is Cheese. Weird name for someone who's lactose intolerant. As soon as Blue hears his brother's new name, he quickly connects the dots and realizes that yes, it's Mac and Cheese. But the comedy quickly vanishes, as Madam Foster declares that the situation with Cheese is just like with his big brother Blue, and that he's also immune from adoption if Mac comes to visit him every day at 3 p.m. Existential terror fills Blue, who realizes that as long as Mac comes to visit him, Cheese will stay at the home and he'll have to share Mac with him. But Mac knows his best friend Blue more than anyone, so he tries to sweeten him up by offering to fix their go-kart and ride down a big hill the two had planned on doing since Blue arrived at Foster's. But with one little caveat, Cheese has to join too. But his dim-witted nature nearly stops the construction of the go-kart altogether. From unscrewing wheels to demanding bunnies be painted on the cart, Cheese is a constant thorn in Blue's side. And the hill they want to go down? Well, Blue decides to take extreme measures to get rid of his cheese problem. Not very mature, sorry. Blue tries to mail him away, puts him up for sale amongst a pile of toys at a store, and when none of these work, he takes drastic action and decides to lock up his brother in a closet. I know Cheese is annoying, but did he have to do that? On some level, I get it. Cheese is, well, he's a few sandwiches short of a picnic, and if Mac spent less time with him, he wouldn't mind. Whereas Blue would miss Mac and the connection they have, as well as feel burdened by his little brother. Luckily, this episode ends with us finding out that Cheese isn't Mac's imaginary friend. Good thing, too. I don't know if Blue could take endless hours of dealing with those chocolate milk demands. I know what you guys are thinking though. No amount of trauma can make up for the way Blue acts. Sooner or later, he's gonna say or do something to the wrong person and get himself in trouble. Well, that's exactly what happens in the episode Beat with a Shtick. Blue, once again, is lapping up the limelight and using other imaginary friends as the butt of his jokes to get cheap laughs. When he comes face to face with an imaginary friend called New Guy. Original, I know. He isn't your run of the mill imaginary friend though. He's gigantic, intimidating, and cold. Uh, whatever this is. They say he comes from the deranged, loony part of town, and he's not to be messed with. But that doesn't stop Blue, who guns for his new target, taking aim at New Guy's height, asking him, how's the weather up there? Normally, you'd laugh that off. But in a new place with a reputation to uphold, New Guy doesn't take Blue's joke lightly and tells him it's about time someone shows him how funny he is. New Guy says he wants to take their situation outside in a meeting at 4 p.m. and tells Blue when he's done with them, he's gonna have funny all over his face. What did Blue expect. Pick on the mean, deranged monster who's got a medieval torture chamber as a bedroom? That is not very smart. We all know Blue is all bark and no bite, and spends the next few hours before his meeting with New Guy completely riddled with anxiety, worrying about just how hard of a beating he's gonna take. He even thinks about running away. When the time comes for Blue to face the music, the whole house has heard about his potential fight with New Guy, and they watch from safety as the giant imaginary friend whips out a huge hammer and asks, what's Blue with red all over? But before Blue can answer, the huge hammer comes crashing down smashing right onto a watermelon? Because Blue is now red all over because of the color of, you get it. It turns out New Guy just wanted to make Blue laugh. The big friend tells Blue that he just wants to learn how to be funny from someone who's a pro at the comedy game. Blue is obviously relieved, but now that the fear has left him, his ego returns, and he tells New Guy that he's not funny, which comes with a punchline Blue earned a long time ago. We know Blue hasn't had it easy, but like I said before, it's no excuse to act the way he does. Maybe it's good someone has put him in his place. Maybe he's learned from his mistakes? Has his quest for attention finally stopped? No, not at all. In a later episode, The Sweet Stench of Success, Blue becomes unbelievably jealous after Eduardo was on TV promoting a small section for the local news called The Friday Friend, where imaginary friends who are up for adoption are shown to finally get a new home. Blue complains to Frankie about not being on TV, and so she obviously tells him that he already has Mac. So why would he want to go on TV and say he's up for adoption? Blue takes her word, but can't seem to get over the fact that other friends are stealing his 
his thunder. So he hatches a plan to get on the airwaves and steal the spotlight. He decides to go to the news station and pretends to be an ill, lonely, imaginary friend who just needs a break. His plan goes much better than expected though, as the station decides that urgent action is needed to help a sick imaginary friend like Blue. So they run an emergency broadcast trying to find someone to help him. He returns to the home to find the entire place angry at him, but he tries to reassure them it's for his acting career, but come on. We all know it was just an act of pure selfishness and ungratefulness. He has Matt. Everyone in the home would love a friend like him, but that's not good enough for Blue. He has to have his cake and eat it too. Karma soon comes knocking for Blue, though, as a Hollywood agent by the name of Kipsnip appears at the home and offers Blue a chance to be a rich and famous actor. Obviously, his ego skyrockets and he signs all the contracts Kip has for him without even reading them. It turns out that the contract he signed was for a commercial deal for a deodorant brand called Deo. Which starts out promising, and like Kip said, he does become rich and famous, but with his newfound fame, Blue completely forgets about his friends, palming them off to his assistant because he thinks he's too big time for his past. So with no friends, Blue focuses on a hard career that quickly takes its toll on him. Kip sees Blue as a cash cow and wheels him out to do promotional gig after promotional gig. The schedule becomes too much for Blue, who decides to quit Hollywood with the hope his friends may take him back. But when he tells Kip of his plans, the contracts he signed earlier are shown to him and they state that Kip is his legal guardian now, and that he's no longer Mac's best friend. The episode wraps up with Blue doing a performance that communicates his situation, and Mac and the gang manage to rescue Blue from Kip's claws by proving that Deo was an awful deodorant and actually made you smell worse. So Blue discarded all of his friends for fame and fortune. Yet when he needed the most, they came to help him. Will he finally see the error of his ways, or has his past of uncertainty and abandonment forever shaped who he is? In the last ever episode of the series, Goodbye to Blue, Blue comes face to face with his worst ever fear. Mac leaving. Mr. Harriman tells him that Mac is moving away, meaning he'll be late to the home. Though shockingly, instead of getting unbelievably upset, Blue hatches a plan with the gang to give his best friend the best final day of all time, as repayment for all that he's done for him. The plan goes off without a hitch. Wilt plays basketball with Mac. Madam Foster bakes him her special cookies, and Frankie has planned a whole surprise party for him. With all this going on, Mac is pulled in every direction, with someone else wanting to spend time with him before he leaves. Blue is frustrated by everyone else spending time with Mac, which is better than than him being jealous about him getting more attention, but instead of doing anything like making a scene or causing trouble, Blue decides to just get out of the way and for once, be selfless. Some time later, Mac finds Blue and the two talk. Blue explains how he feels and Mac is completely confused, happy that Blue has done this for him, but he tells his friend that he's not leaving. Blue, I'm not moving away. What? He's moving houses to the apartment next door because his mom needs a bigger office space, and the apartment they're moving to belongs to Louise and her family. And she has an imaginary friend who will have to stay at Foster's because their new home has a no pets or imaginary friends policy. I wonder who this imaginary friend could be. That's right, it's Cheese. And that's where Blue and Foster's story ends. In the end, despite all of his troubles in the past, when the chips were down, Blue stepped up for his best friend. He was willing to sacrifice one final day with the person who brought him into this world so he could have the send off he deserved. Although personally, I'd say it doesn't really make up for the years of trouble that he caused with all of his attention seeking. But hey, none of us are perfect. Thank you all so much for watching. Let me know down below what your favorite Blue moment is. And let me know if you got any suggestions for other character deep dives. But for now, we will see you all next time. See ya!